Lord Jesus, we want to acknowledge that you are a wonderful Savior. You mean so much to us. And we pray for those who are joining us live on the feed that if at least one person doesn't know you, that they might come to know you to be so wonderful. You have changed our lives. You've given us purpose, a sense of meaning, understanding of how much you love us. And we pray these few moments in your word will nourish our souls and provoke us to reach even further into you. After all, Lord, we are of the resurrection. And we give you our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I'm going to read to you from the NIV version of the Bible and follow through on Georgina on chapter 21 of John's Gospel. I'm just going to read 13 verses. At least you will have read 13 verses this week. I hope you read your Bible sufficiently. Chapter 21, verse 1. After Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two of the disciples were together. I'm going fishing. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, what a great idea, my version. We'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, dear ones, some versions, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. I can imagine, can't you? You don't ask a fisherman if they've caught fish when they've got no fish. And your answers, I've had a few answers of fishermen when I've asked them walking along the seaside. But uh, just in one syllable, no, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, this is the writer talking about himself, John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. For they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. It's a, it's a nice breakfast. Fresh bread. Are you watching? Fresh bread. Can you smell it? Fresh fish, barbecued. My, this is some chef. Wouldn't you like some fish and some warm bread right now? Prob probably not. But they'd been toiling all night. They were tired. They were disappointed. It's a story of their lives. They just can't seem to get it together. They're going through one thing after another, and here they are now on a little hobby launch, only to find with all the skill, with all the talent, with all the gift, they can't catch any fish until Jesus turns up. But this is a wonderful story about how powerful Jesus really is. He's just taken on the devil 
and all his hordes and hosts. He's just dealt with death, the greatest enemy of the human life, and tamed it. <laughs> He's just come through torture and the skin being ripped off his back and being made a show of and suffering deep-seated rejection from his own humanity. And here he is up from the grave tidying, or maybe the angelic power doing it for him, tidying up the linen of the grave clothes, putting everything in its place. And here he is knowing exactly where they are on the GPS, on the sat-nav. They know, he knows exactly where the disciples are fishing. And he turns up and already, I don't know how quick, I don't know how he did it, but the charcoal's burning just at the right temperature, fish is cooked, the bread is ready, the disciples are shattered. I mean, if you want, if you want a real psychologist, you've got it in Jesus. He just knows, just like my wife says, you do not try to talk to the boys when the belly is empty. You know, you've got to be able to get it into proportion. But he's just come back from the dead. In fact, Revelation puts it well when Jesus stands between heaven and earth and says, I am he that lives, and I was dead, but now I'm alive. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. This is the highest you can get. There's no one quite like him. And here he is cooking breakfast for the disciples who are a little bit disheveled and discouraged. I want you to know that God is not outside of the ordinary. In fact, he constantly enters into the ordinary every day of people's lives. Yes, I understand that we can't quite grasp who he is. I understand that he's greater than any definition that we can give him. I understand that he's above our comprehension. Unless he reveals himself to us, we won't fully know him or, or understand who he is. But what you must understand, what the resurrection is saying to us, Jesus said, if you remember, I am the resurrection. What he's saying is, I'm alive and well and I'm moving amongst my people. And I'm busy securing my purpose from one generation to another. Don't edit God out of your circumstance. Don't think it's all about you, your skill, your abilities. Don't ever believe that you can make it all happen just because you've got everything into proportion. I'm telling you, we're going to be quite surprised one day when we really see how engaged God is with our hurting humanity. And here he is after the resurrection. This is a keystone truth. I cannot accept anybody having the right to be in ministry and not believe in the resurrection. It's heresy. I would not kiss the ring. I would not politely excuse them. I would say, unless, unless you believe, just like the Apostle Paul says when he's writing in 1 Corinthians 15, unless the resurrection is real, if it's not real, then we're without hope. We've got no answer to the future. But the resurrection is a statement that good triumphs over evil. Light is greater than dark and death is but your servant. If you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But in our reading in John's gospel, Jesus even knows how to catch fish. And he's talking to his disciples in a way that he's making them come to terms with who they are, their limitations, and their need of him. And he begins to prompt them. 
And he asked the question that people don't want. This strategic intervention of Jesus. He's revealing himself. The word is very interesting, by the way. It's an old-fashioned word that, in, particularly in the authorized version of the Bible, he manifests is the word. It's only used of Mark once. It's nowhere else in the synoptic gospels. It's all over John's writings. He loves this. Because he had encountered for himself what it was to have his eyes unveiled so that he could see who Jesus really was. So his conversion to Jesus Christ was powerful because the Lord opened the eyes of his soul that, so that he could see him. And whenever you read John, be it in his gospel, be it in the book of Revelation, be it in the epistles, whenever you, reveal, you read John, you understand he's a man of revelation. He has had insight into Jesus and who he is, and it's totally captured his soul. And as it was read earlier in an earlier part of our meeting, John himself says, these things are written so that you might know that his witness is true. The testimony is real. This, the half is not told. If I was to tell you the half of what Jesus did in the few short years in his ministry, he said, perhaps there wouldn't be enough room in the whole world to house, to document the majestic way in which Jesus moved in his powerful name. Look at me. This is not a doctrine just for us to celebrate. This is a reality for us to enjoy. That we are of the resurrection and the Savior that we put our trust in is more than able to meet our every need and take us beyond a need orientation into an understanding just of how much we really are loved. This means something. The disciples are discouraged. They're going through. They don't quite know what's going on. And then the Lord has to open their eyes. I will never ever forget the first time somebody told me that I could not really understand either the Bible or God unless I had my spiritual glasses on. And I can remember just a boy speaking to this lady and saying to her, I don't need glasses. I, thank you very much. I don't need glasses. I can read without glasses. Oh, no, 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 not without these glasses. I said, what glasses? Mrs. Rob was her name. What glasses, Mrs. Rob? She said, the Holy Spirit. So that even when you read the Bible... If you're going to really understand without getting locked into legalisms, you're going to need the Holy Spirit just to, just to anoint your eyes, the eyes of your inner being, so that you can see just how wonderful Jesus really is. Uh, this is what John's talking about. Some people said this chapter didn't originally belong in John because it doesn't speak like John. But if I was to tell you I don't know how many times it is, 16 times this word manifest is used by John. In other words, this is the real McCoy. This chapter, this writing was written by John because that's the language that was peculiar to him and special to him. The tendency of this age is to deny that there is a God and even for the church to forget really what's been secured for it. I don't know how many times in my life and ministry I've had to work with people who cannot live within their own skin, who believe that they're worthless and that they're nothing and all they ever think about is their failings and they suffer a deep-rooted rejection. I don't know how many times I've had to be involved in helping people understand that Jesus went to the cross and settled the issue of whether you or I are loved or not. 
even before you knew him, even before you loved him, even when you were an enemy of him and didn't know it. He died for you. He died for me. I'm not throwing stones at you. I'm provoking you with that which provokes me. I know that I know that I am loved of God. It's nothing to do with my shape. Nothing to do with my intelligence or lack of it. The more I read the scriptures, the more I understand how God is integrated into the day-to-day life of our humanity. If he can catch stinking, smelly fish and cook them, deal with the old charcoal, whatever it was in those days, he cares enough to get right down to where we're at, to lift us up to where we need to get to. That's the Jesus of the resurrection. So I don't know, I I know we can go through trauma, I know we can go through adversity and find ourselves between a rock and a hard place, but I, I want you to know Jesus knows about a rock and a hard place. And when he turns up, he's gonna turn their lives around and he's gonna show them some things that they will never forget. You've caught no fish, have you? No. Then cast your net on the right side and there's a miraculous harvest waiting to happen if only you do as I tell you. Now there's something deeper going on here and I just want you to know there's something deeper going on in your life and in my life so you better stay awake. This is very important. This is a deja vu moment. You see, If you go back earlier in the Gospels, you will discover that Jesus was talking in a boat because there was no room for him to speak to the people. And after he'd finished some eloquent speaking, he turned to his disciples who loved fishing and he said, go on, cast your net out. And they pulled the net in and the nets were breaking. There were too many fish. They couldn't even pull the nets in without the help of other ships other boats and so what was taking place in this stark moment of discouragement was a rehearsal of what had already happened miraculously all those months ago before Jesus died and so what happened was John listen to me carefully because some of us are slow on the uptake But when you get it, you really get it. That was Peter. John already saw it. I remember this. I remember the miracle. I remember when we had nothing and Jesus told us to do this. And we had a wonderful haul of fish. And all of this must have been going on, computing in his mind. Because he then blurted out without even thinking, it's the Lord. Jesus was reminding them not to forget what he had taught them, not to forget what they'd experienced right from the beginnings of their walk with him. They understand that he's a a miraculous God. They understood that he's the Messiah. They understood that he had powers that no man knew of. They understood by word of testimony in their own lives, miracle after miracle, They'd seen the blind eyes opened. They'd seen the lame able to walk. They'd seen the dead rise again. They'd seen the leper being touched. The blind being kissed. This is Jesus. Sometimes you forget. You look back over your short life And if you look far enough, you remember Jesus turned up. Jesus turned around your situation. It wasn't you. It wasn't your skill. It wasn't your gift, your talent. It wasn't your measure of faith. It was his grace. He turned up and he turned you around. And God says, don't you ever forget who I am. I've taught you enough. 
to know that I am real. All of this is beginning to dawn. That's what it means by manifesting, unveiling, uncovering, revealing, opening their senses to the reality that they're on the winning side. They're of the resurrection. He's doing something even deeper. He's about to arrest the soul of Peter. He's about to show Peter he's not to live in the death. He's got to come up higher into the resurrection. So then when he calls them over, feeds them, Peter's enjoyed his breakfast. If, if he's a real fisherman, he knows how to eat. Then after he'd had his fold, Jesus called him over. Simon Peter, do you love me? Do you love me with the love of God? Simon Peter was irritated. You see, Peter had to deal with something his failure. He had to really understand forgiveness like he would never understand or understood forgiveness but for what he had gone through. He had to understand that forgiveness is not just a policy for a rainy day, but forgiveness is the heart of God. And he swore three times. He denied Christ three times. He tried to fit him with the pagan. Yet he loved Jesus. How do you think did Je How do you think Peter felt? Peter felt so angry with himself, so hurting on the inside. Peter was still wrestling and having nightmares. Peter knew full well that Jesus cared, but do I care? And now Jesus has fed him, and now Jesus is coming at him, and look how many times he comes at him. One, two, three. Forgiveness will deal with every failure in our lives. Who is it that condemns me? Who is it that speaks little of me? Who is it that despitefully uses me? And there's Peter. Jesus has caught him. Jesus, you know I love you. Do, do you love me with the love of God? You know I love you like a brother. Do you love me with the love of God? You know I love you like a brother. Do you love me like a brother? Third time. You know all things. Come on now, you know everything. Lord, I know that you know that you know everything about me, but it, don't you know what it feels like, Lord? Of course he does. He prophesied that this is what Peter goes, will go through. And he even prophesies about the end for Peter. Doesn't look a very tasteful end. But what he's saying, you've got what it takes to come back up again. You're of the resurrection. You look like you're asleep and I feel like I want to cry. I just, I just don't know why the church does not understand forgiveness is not an optional extra. If it's an optional extra, you have no chance in hell. Forgiveness is what we're made of. He died on the cross to cancel out our sin, to contain our failures, failures and our weaknesses. And now he's called as a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And here we are going around dribbling all over the place, finding it hard to forgive ourselves and even harder to forgive others. John had a revelation. I think it's time for us to come to terms with the fact that if we're of the resurrection, 
then we've got a testimony worth living and walking through. We can face the biggest challenges, and God knows Jesus never ever minced his words, in the world you will have tribulation. Welcome to the tribulation. In the world you will be tested. In the world you'll be misunderstood, but don't get on your high horse. Love people. Forgive people. You hear me? Because if you don't, you're going to work against the resurrection. You're going to try and undo. Do you want Christ to go back on the cross, says Peter in his epistles? Do you want him to hang on the cross again? Was that not enough? See, Alan, this is a hard word. Good. You say, this has got some bitter herbs in it. Good. I like ice cream with a few bitter herbs. We're of the resurrection. We have no, we have no option. I believe in the resurrection. I believe that He's risen from the dead. I believe that he cancels out all my shortcomings. And it doesn't make me feel big. It makes me feel humble. Because I didn't deserve one bit. I love the way Jesus catches Peter in the net. And comes to him. And causes him to face the reality. You know why? Unless you face up to the issues, you'll be bedeviled by them for the rest of your life. And when you should grow up into the gift of maturity and the full of expression of who you are, you'll always be limited. Because you'll always see things through your own little argument. God says, I've got bigger things for you. I love this. Profound change is being called for by Jesus. I can change how fruitful. Without me, it says in the Bible, doesn't it? Without me, talking about the vine. Without me, you can't do anything. But with me, you can do all things. Amen? So we can reverse the situation. We can not just say, oh, thank you, he's forgiven me. No, he can restore you. And he was doing this for Peter. But you've got to deal with the inordinate demands upon your time and on your energy. Here they are tired. They've got a good work ethic. I was taught, you know, from a boy, my mother. I love the bones of my mother. She was tough. But she cared. She said, Alan, don't you ever think that hard work does you any harm. And even when I was doing well in school and getting to the place where I wanted to go further on into university, my mother had other options. You're part of a big family, you need to work hard. So later on in life, I did some of my academic study because I enjoyed research. I enjoyed, I loved exams. People laugh at that. I just loved exams. Sorry about that. I loved it. But you can end up with a work ethic that robs you of everything else. You're so busy. What are you busy about? Trying to survive? I get that. Could it be that you could end up always busy for the rest of your life because you enjoy it? I enjoy being busy. The only times, if Betty's not with me, I'll work too long. But if she cooks a meal and we sit down together, I have no option. I've got to go and sit down. <laughs> so because I'm getting older now, this is, this, is, this is in the public arena. Because I'm getting older now, she says, why don't you stop pottering around and come and sit down? But sometimes we are too busy. And we're trying to succeed. What in, I don't quite know. But don't allow even that which is good in your life, that which occupies your time, don't allow it to rub from your soul. Don't allow it. Don't grow tired. Don't grow harsh. Don't go dry. Don't go bitter. Don't expend your energy and still be dissatisfied. Jesus comes to restore that which is lost.
That's what the resurrection is all about. I do believe that there's such a thing as a devil. It's not kosher, excuse the metaphor, to talk about the darker side. But if anything the enemy ever wants, the enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ and of your soul ever really wants, he wants you to become a dry old stick full of bitterness, singing the choruses with amen at the end. But he doesn't want you to live the life of resurrection. God, I refuse to be diminished. You hearing me? I refuse to go into my shell and give up with my cynicism of the world and I refuse to be judgmental of people I could smack across the face sometimes because they're so stupid. (laughs) And I refuse to fight back at people who fight at me because I'm of the resurrection. I want you to know this is not just a sermon This is a vital reality in the kingdom of God that we know how to move in our circumstances however adverse they may may be. We know this, that God is at work in all things for our good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose because we are of the resurrection. Let's celebrate it. Let's stand before the Lord.